It's the last day of spring in Fargo, North Dakota, and residents see something concerning to the west, a strong tornado heading straight for downtown. By the time June 20th, 1957 was over, five total tornadoes would touch down in and around the Fargo area, including a devastating F5 tornado that tore through downtown. The damage that was left behind could be described as catastrophic and disastrous. As residents began to assess and pick up the damage, one particular person from the University of Chicago expressed significant interest in analyzing the damage. That man was none other than Ted Fujita. The research that he would conduct from this event was groundbreaking and would change the course of meteorology forever. Fargo is a city in far eastern North Dakota that shares a border with Minnesota. In the modern era, Fargo is an expansive city with a population of 131,444 as of 2022, but it wasn't that way back in 1957. In 1957, Fargo housed a population of 43,000 in a much less expansive city than the present day. Back in 1957, scientists and weather forecasters had very little technology and information to make accurate weather forecasts, but on June 20th, 1957, they had a feeling that there was thunderstorms to come later in the day, and they were right. Forecasters noticed a surface low over eastern Montana with a cold front that stretched to the northwest and was in progress of swinging down into the area. At 500 millibars, or roughly 20,000 feet, a shortwave ridge was present which would allow for moisture to collect and help storms form later in the day. Shear was also more than sufficient, with surface winds out of the southeast and 500 millibar winds out of the west-southwest. These were environmental conditions that certainly would have been supportive of thunderstorms and tornadoes, but not necessarily strong to violent tornadoes, so there must have been some other underlying factors at play here. The first of those underlying factors was a likely outflow boundary that situated itself around the Fargo area that would help aid and enhance thunderstorms and the tornado later in the day. Although we don't have state-by-state -state detailed surface analysis maps from this day, we do have regional ones that do help support this theory. When we take a look at the surface analysis of the area at 7 a.m. Central Time on that day, we notice that there was light rain falling in northwest North Dakota. Three hours later at 10 a.m. Central Time, the rain had moved east and further developed in central North Dakota. Another three hours later at 1 p.m., a thunderstorm was reported near Devil's Lake, North Dakota. And over the course of the next few hours, these elevated thunderstorms which were occurring near and along the warm front would produce an outflow boundary, which is an area of cool and drier air. You can even see the outflow boundary on this map taken at 3 p.m., which is depicted by the sharp decrease in temperatures. The other underlying factor that was at play was the dew point. When you look at the dew point in Fargo in the early afternoon of the 20th, it was in the upper 50s, and by the evening it was approaching 70. And when you take a look at the big picture of the country on that day, you notice something peculiar. There was ample moisture around the Gulf states, as you would expect, then a very dry air mass over Kansas and Nebraska, and then it was moist again over the northern plains. So how could moisture get to North Dakota if there was an extremely dry air mass in between that and the Gulf of Mexico? The answer to that is that it likely wasn't moisture from the Gulf of Mexico, it was actually moisture from corn. And yes, that corn. The term evapotranspiration is described as the process by which water is transferred from the land into the atmosphere by evaporation from the soil and other surfaces, and by transpiration from the plants. June 20th happens to fall right around the peak growing season in the United States, and corn acts as a giant straw that pumps millions of gallons of water into the atmosphere on hot sunny days. This natural occurring event even has a nickname, which is known as corn sweat. And yes, it's real, you can look it up. In a perfect scenario, corn sweat can raise the dew point by 5 to 10 degrees, but it should be mentioned that due to this happening almost 70 years ago, the exact extent that this helped on June 20th, 1957 is not known for certain. And now that we have established these two underlying factors that were at play on this day, we now have an environment that is supportive of strong to violent tornadoes occurring in this area. By the evening, a significant severe weather setup was now in place, but the extent was not known by the weather forecasters in Fargo just yet. The forecasters already had very limited resources to assist them, and it didn't help them any further that the nearest radar was 205 miles away, there was very sparse updates about the weather, and there was no storm spotter network in place to help them out. 
These factors basically led forecasters to look out their window and their bleak information that they had and having to make judgment calls. And sometime during the mid-afternoon, storms would begin to develop along the warm front and previously mentioned outflow boundary. At 5.58 p.m., forecasters in Fargo noticed building cumulus clouds off to their west. And these clouds would be the ongoing supercell that would go on to wreak havoc in Fargo in just a short while. What they didn't know yet was that this supercell that was heading towards town was already in the process of producing tornadoes. Sometime around 4.30 p.m., the storm put down its first tornado which touched down just to the east of Buffalo, North Dakota and tracked slowly northeast. The tornado meandered northeast and threaded the needle between the towns of Absarica and Wheatland before dissipating shortly afterwards. The tornado was on the ground for roughly 11 miles and was rated as an F-Zero as it didn't really hit anything. Almost immediately after lifting, the supercell would produce another tornado which touched down just to the south of where tornado number one lifted. The new tornado briefly traveled due east before making a turn to the southeast. At this same time, the weather forecasters off to the east in Fargo noticed this tornado on the ground and began preparing their warning bulletins. The tornado eventually passed just north of the town of Castleton before it would also dissipate just east of town. This tornado was on the ground for 5 miles and was slightly more substantial than the first one. It was rated as an F2. And now that weather forecasters had actually seen a tornado from the storm that was heading towards town, they sent out their weather bulletins to alert the public to seek shelter. Ironically, this actually did the opposite, and just as people do today, residents in Fargo instead headed outside with their cameras to try and document the tornado that was coming. Although this was not the safe decision made by many residents, it would lead to the following tornado to be incredibly well documented, especially by 1957 standards. As the storm drifted into the Fargo area, residents began snapping away on their cameras and documented the bizarre structure of the storm. Many residents didn't know what they were looking at, and some even thought that this low-hanging cloud was actually the tornado. However, this low-hanging cloud was actually the wall cloud and inflow tail, which was not really known at the time. More on this later. Just moments later, the rotating wall cloud spat out a small funnel, which soon became tornado number three. The tornado touched down on the north side of town, near the present-day intersection of 12th Ave North and 45th Street North. As the tornado touched down, residents continued to take pictures and record video of the incredible scene that was unfolding before their eyes. Although this area of town is populated today, back in 1957 it didn't house that much, so for the first few minutes of the tornado's life it didn't actually hit that much. That would soon change though as the tornado approached the Golden Ridge subdivisions. The Golden Ridge subdivisions were an area of cheaply constructed houses where a lot of low-income residents of Fargo lived. When the increasingly violent and slow-moving tornado moved into the subdivision just after 7.30 p.m., the home stood no chance. The tornado, which was only moving at roughly 10 miles per hour, took 90 seconds to cross the few blocks of the subdivisions, leaving utter devastation in its wake. This footage was also taken at approximately the same time as the tornado was hitting the Golden Ridge subdivision. After crossing the Golden Ridge subdivision, the tornado continued moving southeast on a very alarming course, straight towards downtown Fargo. However, just before entering the downtown corridor, the tornado made a sudden shift to the northeast, potentially saving hundreds of lives. However, the sudden turn to the northeast put the North Dakota Agricultural College in the crosshairs, though. The college just happened to be hosting hundreds of high school boys for the annual FFA convention, which started at 7 p.m. At 7.30 p.m., the boys were notified about the tornado that was coming, and everybody scattered around campus to seek shelter. Luckily for them, the tornado just barely clipped the southern side of the campus. Although the college dodged this bullet, much of northern Fargo was not as lucky. Just to the south of the campus, the Silver City Faculty Housing Complex, the YMCA, and the Hasty Tasty Restaurant all took significant damage from the tornado. After this, the tornado turned once again more to the east and continued trudging through northern Fargo. The homes in this area took heavy damage, with many left without the upper levels of the house or even their walls. The Sacred Heart Covenant took a direct hit with the building sustaining major damage. Luckily though, the nuns were able to seek shelter before the tornado hit and they all survived. After passing this part of town, the tornado began to weaken, although it still produced ample damage in northeastern Fargo. The tornado began to turn more to the northeast again as it crossed the border into Minnesota. 
It would continue following the border for another couple of miles before fully occluding and performing a half loop before it finally roped out. Numerous residents also managed to photograph the tornado as it was roping out. The tornado was on the ground for roughly 9 miles and 30 minutes. The tornado reached a max width of 500 yards and was eventually rated as an F5. The tornado resulted in 12 total fatalities and 103 injuries. Damages were estimated to be $25.25 million, which adjusted for inflation is $282 million. After the tornado roped out, word got out pretty quickly about what had happened and the damage that had occurred. Residents heard that the Golden Ridge subdivision was gone, so first responders naturally headed straight for there. Unfortunately, there wasn't much that they could do, and of the 12 deaths that occurred from this tornado, all of them occurred in the Golden Ridge subdivision. The supercell, however, though, would not be done yet, and continued moving slowly off to the east. After traveling east for another 7 miles, the supercell would produce another tornado. This one touched down on the north side of the town of Glendon, Minnesota, and moved east. After traveling east for roughly 5 miles, the tornado made an abrupt turn to the north, and traveled for another 5 miles in this direction before it also roped out. This tornado was another strong one, it was rated as an F4. The survey found that this tornado severely damaged trees and practically demolished one farm. Once again, the storm continued moving slowly off to the east before it would produce its fifth and final tornado of the night. This one touched down just to the northeast of the town of Hawley and initially moved northeast. This tornado had an erratic track and soon thereafter turned east, then southeast, and then northeast before it eventually dissipated over Stinking Lake. This tornado was on the ground for 7 miles and was also on the stronger side, and was rated as an F3. It did stay over mainly rural areas, but did moderately damage a few farms. Over the coming days, word got out across the country of what had happened in Fargo, and one man from the University of Chicago expressed great interest in assessing the damage. And that man was none other than Ted Fujita. Fujita had flown to the U.S. from Japan just a few years prior and was studying individual processes occurring within thunderstorms. He saw what happened in Fargo and thought it'd be great for his research if he assessed the damage there. Fujita soon thereafter arrived in Fargo and began observing the damage and interviewing as many residents as he possibly could. Residents were very surprised to see this genius Japanese man take interest in what had happened to them, and were just as interested with Fujita as he was with them. Fujita meticulously interviewed hundreds of people and collected as many photos and videos of the tornado as possible for his research. Over the course of the next two years, he carefully crafted a written analysis of the tornado which was way ahead of its time. The research paper was 67 pages long and depicted many things including the environmental conditions that led to the tornadoes, detailed damage path maps, maps showing how the tornado scattered debris, and much more. One of the most impressive pieces was a map that showed where each tornado photo that he received was taken, with the exact triangulated position of the tornado as well. In addition to this, he chronologically organized each tornado picture that he received and made a full depiction of the Fargo tornado's life. He then also took all of the photographs that he received of the storm structure and drew the rest of the storm features that were just out of frame in each photograph. He drew by hand pictures of the wall cloud, collar cloud, and mesocyclone. These terms were not really known in 1957, and Fujita's research paper helped cement these terms into the meteorology vocabulary that we use today. In addition to all of this, he recorded his own videos which depict the environment on that day, and included the time shown by the clock in the bottom right. Impressively, he also did one of these animations for the position of the wall cloud and the tornado as it approached and entered Fargo. Finally, he made his own animation of what the tornado actually looked like based off of the photos and videos that he received. This research paper would make huge leaps and bounds for the subject of meteorology, and this specific tornado was one of the contributing factors that would lead Ted Fujita to create the Fujita scale 14 years later in 1971. When he created the F scale, he formally rated the Fargo tornado as the highest level on the scale, F5. As for what happened back in Fargo, the warning process was actually a pretty good success, especially by 1957 standards, with residents having upwards of one hour of lead time before the tornado entered the town. It did help though that the storm was extremely slow moving, was low precipitation, and residents could see the Castleton tornado from 20 miles away. As for the 12 fatalities that occurred in the Golden Ridge subdivision, 
It was sadly just one of those cases where the residents never stood a chance in poorly built houses if they sheltered above ground. To the present day, this is only the second F5 tornado to have hit North Dakota, and it's the deadliest to have struck the state. If you're interested in reading Dr. Ted Fujita's fantastic piece on this paper, I'll link it in the description down below. As for now though, that's going to wrap up this video. I hope you guys learned something and thank you so much for watching.